people, you know, are using their homes like ATM machines, you know, it never ends well. So what's happening right now is payment shock. Think about the impact of refinancing out of a 3%, for example, into a 7%. That spike in refinances is predominantly cash out. What's up guys, I'm Nobody Special, and once again, I've got my buddy Travis is with me from Real Estate Mindset. How are you doing today, Travis? Nice to finally shake your hand, sir. Thank you, you it is well? great to meet you in person. We're out here in Maryland. Todd Sachs from Sachs Realty was nice enough to invite us out to look at his new studio. We're making some content this week. And uh, we got an important thing to talk about right now because I saw something last week that stuck out at me. I, it just didn't make sense to me. The, the applications to refinance a home are way up in the last couple of weeks. In, in particular, the refi index spiked by 11%. Now, when I see refis rising, we're talking about people who had two and a half, three, maybe 4% mortgages, and they're refinancing into a 6.5% mortgage. All right. And obviously something here doesn't smell right. I've had some people reach out to me and say, yeah, you know, I, I had something like that. I tapped the equity in my home to put a new roof on and it made sense because of insurance costs. I'm not sure that's enough to explain a national trend. But we've also got some similar things, maybe not similar things, but some uh, coincident things going on in the economy, like mortgage forbearance ended not too long ago and eviction moratoriums ended not too long ago. So we had people who had the largest expense in their life, the rent and the mortgage, went away for a yeah. year and a half. So they didn't really feel that inflation that snuck up on them in 21 and 22. They did. Everything got more expensive. But while everything was getting more expensive, their biggest budget item was gone. Mm -hmm. Now it's come back and everything is still more expensive. And now people are tapping the equity in their homes to meet that expensive cost of living. And you've got a very unique perspective here. You've been there, you've been following these trends very closely. So tell us a little bit about what you see going on here, what's behind it, and, and how does this end? Well, first of all, Jack, there's two reasons why someone's gonna refinance. For, for the most part, you know, minus reamortizing, okay? Either people are gonna refinance for rate and term, Okay, you get a lower rate, lower payment, which we know that's pretty much not possible uh, because 8% rates were only three months ago. So why you don't even have the equity to refinance into a lower rate. And the second reason people refinance, and this is probably the main thing because of the unaffordability, is cash out. So what we see right now is that spike, even though it's still historically low, all right, that spike in refinances is predominantly cash out. And then you would ask, okay, well, you know, and then we're talking about normal consumers. Why would be people be cashing out right now? So then you ask, okay, well, why are people cashing out? <clears throat> A few reasons, right? Pretty much, let's just say there's three reasons. To invest, okay? What is there to invest in right now? The, the all-time high stock market? What is there to, you can invest in T-bills at 5% with your 8% rate? I don't think so. So investing, not really. Second thing, home improvement. You know, maybe people are doing that, doing home improvement. But the third and probably, you know, the biggest reason is cash out to pay off debt or rather what we call it debt consolidation. But the problem is, Jack, in what you just said is, <clears throat> especially people that were in these forbearance programs, um, you know, or even doing rent, the rent moratoriums in the mortgage industry. When we ran files through automated underwriting, the underwriting would always pick up. And, and as a loan officer would warn us about something called payment shock. So what's happening right now is payment shock. So what a lot of people have done is they've just replaced the rent payment with some other form of debt. So <laughs> there's probably people right now that stopped paying their rent and instead bought an $80,000 Mercedes. And they can afford it because guess what? This rent moratorium, or I have rights now, I'm entitled now, I don't have to pay my bills. And so, you know, the refinancing is such a red flag. Thank God it's still, you know, it's still relatively low, but it's, you guys, it's, it's, it's such a red flag because think about the impact of refinancing out of a 3%, for example, into a 7%. That's a form of payment shock for homeowners. So we got payment shock from renters, but now we have payment shock for homeowners. So if someone already couldn't afford to pay their credit cards off because of bad spending habits, they refinance, their payments maybe five, six, seven hundred dollars higher, but they locked that in for 30 years. And that only lasts 
for so long. And I'll, I'll say this, and this is very personal. I, you know, this is the first time I've actually acknowledged this even you know, to anyone on YouTube, uh, including, I haven't even said this to my own viewers, but right before I had foreclosure, right before you know, I lost everything, I had foreclosure, bankruptcy, repo, and then I had a tax lien that was the result of the foreclosure, I did a cash out refinance. Um, and I cashed out $80,000 right before the, the crash. Now, in my mind, I was doing the right thing. Okay, so I got $80,000 and about $50,000 of that I paid to the IRS. So again, bad spending habits. I had enough money to pay taxes as I went along but because of my, my obsessive nature, right, and my lack of financial maturity and unrealistic um, expectations, I spent the money in two weeks. I spent $80,000 in two weeks, and then a few months later, I lost everything. So I did everything that I could until the final, to the very end in my own life, until there was nothing left. And I lost everything, Jack. And um, it was just so compoundingly worse because... What happened was, is as a result of foreclosure, there was a deficiency notice issued in my name. And what a deficiency notice is, is for, just as an example, say I owed on my loan, on my mortgage, $400,000. But the bank sold my home, hypothetically, for $300,000. The difference in the two is $100,000. So what happens is, is the lender that I foreclosed with issued me a four, like a 1099, okay? Was, I think, I can't remember, it was a 1099 G or something, they issued me a 1099 for $180,000 and sent it to the IRS. And the IRS said, Travis, we don't give a crap <laughs> about your struggles. You owe us $120,000. And that, and basically when there's a lien issued against you, they own the shirt of, on your back. And so that lien, you know, obviously I didn't have enough money to pay it. I had lost everything. I was in mortgage. Um, I had to run out the statute of limitations and, you know, something similar is going to happen to people that are cashing out, that are trading in their $2,000 payment to a $3,000 payment. If they're not refinancing very, very specifically and wisely, I mean, I, I mean, the thing what I'm really trying to say, Jack, is I see the same thing happening right now and I just want to say it's unnecessary. And if I look back at my own situation, what I wish I would have done is sold. If I would have sold, I could have got that money and prevented so much catastrophe, but I was a victim of my own decision to be part of mainstream media just by home values never crash. And so to me, it is shocking that we see something potentially even worse happening right now. So thank you for sharing that. That's Deeply personal story and some some pretty incredible numbers in there. If we could, first of all, you touched on the fact that the refis are historically low. Thank you for pointing that out because if you do, if you zoom out on that refi chart, you'll see they were way higher in 21 and 22, right? They, they should have been because yeah. it was advantageous to refi. Mm -hmm. the, the point here is that it is very much not advantageous to refi yes. and people are doing it out of desperation. Correct. And... This is exactly what you went through in the GFC. We're seeing it yeah. play out exactly the same way. Maybe there's some things that are different. Um, so thank you for sharing that story. Now, and I think that one part about the tax lien, the mm. deficiency notice, really blew me away. So correct me again on the numbers. You owed 400 on the house yeah, after the equity that you had cashed out to consolidate debt. Went into foreclosure. And studies have shown that when people consolidate debt by, by tapping into their home equity, they don't change their spending patterns. They tend to just run that credit card right back up anyway. Exactly. So you end up in foreclosure after you do that. The bank sells your house for 300000 and you get handed a 1099 that says there's $100,000 in income for you there and you owe taxes on that. Yeah, the numbers that I gave you, though, I just did for simplicity, was Round actually 680000 and I believe they sold the house for around four hundred thousand. So, so, and unfortunately, I filed back then. You could file if you went through something like like this. You could file something called insolvency during that period of time. The problem is, as a result of my depression and just giving up hope, I let the time run out. So when I finally came back and realized, you know, I had these tax liabilities, it was too late 
for me to file insolvency. And so that son of a gun followed me around, like I said, for nine years. It almost prevented me from being a loan officer because as a loan officer, you're supposed to demonstrate credit worthiness. And how can you demonstrate credit worthiness in their eyes if you have a lien for six figures? And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just, you know, when you're down, man, they just keep you down. And it is so much harder to get back up. Everyone can get back up. So there's hope. Uh, tenacity is real. Um, you know, initiative is real. But but also what's real is like self-sabotage. And I see people self-sabotaging. And, in the, and the thing I really want to say, Jack, is it's like it's so easy to see what's going on if you put a little bit effort into thinking about it. Right. It's an uncomfortable freedom. It's uncomfortable. But by God, do you want to be a slave to debt? Wouldn't you rather be free to live your life and not have to constantly explain to employers, oh, I have my credit, this, this, you know, and, and explain to the IRS, I'm sending the payment and I'm sorry it's late. I had to pay for food on my table. I had to pay for my son to go to preschool so that I could work. Preschool, um, I'm sorry, daycare, uh, when, I was going, when I was a full-time dad, daycare was almost half of my take-home income. So half my take-home income goes there, about another 30% goes to my rent. And all I had you know, to afford was, and, and I, I, I ended up doing this really good, was instant mashed potatoes and chicken. That's all we had for, for the longest time. You You're know? making me hungry, Travis. <laughs> it was really good, man. I mean, I roasted it in the oven. But my point is it is not necessary to go through the pain that I did. And I barely made it out of life. And I, you know, and I had so much tenacity as a kid, man, so much determination and faith in God and faith in myself. But when I was addicted to money and my bad spending habits, and I became my own victim following the rat race, bro, I lost everything with, it felt like overnight. And Jack, I was in the industry, man, the same type of consumer reckless spending is happening right now. And we could argue like, yeah, it was way bigger in 2001, but they dropped the rates to 5%. So everyone was refinancing. Absolutely. No one should, mo I mean, the, maybe some cases, but people shouldn't be refinancing from a 3% to, to 7% just to get a hundred thousand dollars. You go from, if you already can't afford to live, you go from a $2,000 payment to a $3,000 payment, but for 30 years, at least if it's a credit card, you could pay it off when you get money or a car loan is five years. Well, now it could be up to seven, but when you lock it in your house, the devastation that can create <clears throat> is really, really overwhelming. So before I went into foreclosure, I got with a realtor and I tried to do a short sale, but guess what? The market was tanking. So no one bought the house. It sat there. I had the deficiency notes. The only way they could sell it was, you know, $300,000 under market. And I was so depressed seeing house values go down because I'm like, dang, that house is 60% under. But guess what? I can't play no more. I'm on time out. I couldn't even get it, uh, uh, barely be, get a secure credit card for two, $300. People don't understand how bad things can get, unfortunately, Jack, until it happens to them. But the thing is, what I want to say is, is you can break that trend. You can see what happened to people like me through the last GFC. Now you could choose not to believe me or you could choose not to listen to me. That's fine. But for the people that are listening, there's nothing wrong with being patient. Absolutely nothing wrong with being patient. And there's nothing wrong with not buying the freaking, what are those cups from Starbucks? Like what the, we don't have to guess at reckless spending habits. You know, 70% GDP consumer spending. 70% of America paycheck to paycheck. Could, I remember the anxiety that living, cause you know, to get it out of the ditch, I was living paycheck to paycheck for nine freaking years, nine years of paycheck. Every month, Jack was anxiety. Every month I had to figure out how do I afford food? How do, cause I have to pay my rent. I have to pay my daycare. I only have $50 left. That's no way that, you know, that's no way to live life. And you know, again, that was the result ultimately of me. My decision was important, but I let mainstream media do the thinking for me. Let me ask you, all that stuff that you bought when you ran up the credit card debt, was there any happiness in that stuff? Did it improve your quality of life? Did it make you happy? Okay. Or did it just make I things was, worse? And this is crazy, man. I was... Well, losing my mom, you know, that, that was probably the worst time of my life, but I was part, a lot of that time I, I, I was the least happy in my life. So at the times where I was making the most money, the $40,000, I mean, how am I making $40,000 and I'm also drowning in credit card debt? It was the most unhappy that I had ever been. 
because I was taking all this hard, I'm doing all this hard work, so I felt entitled to be able to buy. It was a coping mechanism because I was burnt out working so hard, so I'm gonna get the leather jacket and the Ray-Bans. I'm gonna get ensembles, I'm gonna keep spending, and oh, oh, there's a market crash? Well, I don't feel it yet, so I'm gonna refinance, I'm gonna get 80 grand, I'll pay the IRS to get off my back, and then I'm gonna go spend like a lunatic until the party's over and the bill was due, and guess what? I lost my job because the mortgage industry crashed the domino effect that can, the probability, we don't know if things are certain, but I'd be like, God, man, absent a bailout, like how does it not crash? Um, people need to be careful and wake up. And we know that QT is not normal. Quantitative tightening is not normal. We need to, you, the economy needs money growth, right? To sustain. The problem right now, people are not understanding the lag. You know, and I, and I was, I was, caught off guard a little bit by like, you know, the reverse repo market, the liquidity, you know, things like that. But we, it makes sense that the lag is going to take a little longer because there's more money to be burned out of the system. Whereas the GFC is just, whew, right, we just blew a little bit and it came crashing down. We are in a period of quantitative time that is exceeding the GFC. And the thing is, Jack, a healthy economy, we can go up in rates. We stay at 8% because it's a healthy economy. You know, if people don't believe us, look at the 70s and 80s. Everyone likes to compare the 70s and 80s. Dude, they had rates like 17% and kept on kicking, brother. And people saved at an 11% savings rate. Right now, every freaking thing is in the gutter. Savings ability, except for maybe the 1%. You know, the people on the very bottom right now are getting crushed. Now we don't see it in the data, unfortunately. You know, some some parts of the data because you got the moratoriums, you got all these band aids covering someone that just got shot up full of bullet holes. But we're bleeding out, man. We're bleeding out. So, a lot of, a lot of lessons here. And again, thank you for sharing that personal story. I could see it in your face. That, that's not an easy story to tell. <laughs> Dude, but you're funny. sharing that with people people who hopefully are going to learn from this and not repeat those mistakes. You obviously came out of it stronger on the other side, yes. a lot smarter. Now you're the, one of the hardest working guys I've ever met. You never stop. Thank you. It stuck with you for nine years. Now pay attention to this, guys, because you doom spenders who are out there, and I know you're out there, you're convincing yourself you deserve this. Whatever that hole is in your life, you're trying to fill it with stuff. It won't fill that hole. It won't make you feel better. It'll make you feel worse in the long run. It's a sugar high. It stuck with you for nine years. The tax lien didn't go away. So not only you had the mortgage people on you, you had the IRS on you yeah, on scary. top of that. It affected your employability yep. as a loan officer. That sticks with you. Um, self-sabotage was the phrase you used. It's and true. There, you know, a lot of people have that tendency. Um, watch out for this stuff, guys. When I saw that refinance index spiking 11%, this is what I saw behind that number is thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of stories like this of people who are desperate, people who are in debt, people who are struggling, legitimately struggling because of the cost of inflation and what's happened. Forget the why, folks. Forget how wrong it is. Forget how unfair it is. It is unfair. It is wrong. It shouldn't be this way, but it is this yeah. way. This is the hand we have been dealt. We have no choice but to play it. And if you're out there doom spending... Go back, rewind this video, and watch it again. Listen to what Travis went through. Look at his face when he's telling that story. Well, it hurts. It hurts, man, because think about what I'm saying, dude. I was I was a prodigy, man. You know, I started in mortgage. I got, I got my real estate and my loan officer, like, because it was simultaneous back then in California. I got it. I, I had it test passed. Every, all the paperwork turned in 10 days after I turned 19. I owned, people don't get this because I don't ever, I, I don't want to brag or anything like that, but I owned my first investment property when I was 20 years old. I couldn't even legally drink alcohol because I was on it. You know, you see me working hard now. Imagine when I had the energy. My kids take my energy now. I was very, you know, capable of making, you know, tremendous amounts of money, understanding how to make money investing. And even I, being an industry pro at the time, prodigy, allowed myself to be blindsided. And so... You, know, <laughs> you see the same thing happening here. If, if I was in the industry, if I know all this stuff and I still allowed myself to be blindsided, I mean, what do we really, do we think that the youth right now is, is more responsible with their money? Not when we look at the you know, down payment coming from parents, right? Uh, there's, a, there's a spending crisis going on right now. People are bitter 
and resentful at the cost. And because of that resentment, because of that bitterness, they, you know, there, there are a, a portion of people that are trying to fill the hole, like you said, with buying stuff. I know that so well because that's, that's what I did in, in, the, in the past. And brother, imagine what that did to me mentally. Going from like, oh, yeah, I was getting the, the rookie of the year, was the employee of the month, like every month breaking records. And then, boom, you're dog crap for nine years, buddy. Good luck making it out of the gutter. You want welfare? Just take some welfare. Go ahead. Right? So it was hard. And, and I couldn't even get a job. And if I would have just buckled down, say, a year, even a year, even one, even six months, Jack. If I would have buckled down six months before I lost everything, things would be completely different right now. I missed out on so many opportunities to invest as a result. So many. Travis, thank you so much for sharing that story. And, and again, folks, I know you're feeling that anger. I know you're angry at the way things are. And that is a righteous, entirely justified anger. But it is not an excuse to punish yourself by giving up and buying into this doom spending trend and take it from Travis's words, he's lived this. It's stuck with him for nine years. Where do you want to be in nine years? Do you want to be paying for today's mistakes nine years from now? So you can be angry. You can be upset yeah. about the way the situation is. But harness that anger productively. Allow it to drive you to mm -hmm. make better decisions. Learn from mistakes Travis made. Learn from mistakes I made when I lost all the money I made commercial fishing. Oh, buying man. my first house by FOMOing into the real estate market. I did not know and that. I lost it all. I didn't um, know that. Learn from our mistakes so you don't have to repeat them and you guys can have it even better. Thanks again, Travis. It has been such a pleasure yeah, to man. meet you in person finally. Thank you for inviting me on this yeah, trip. of course. And everybody, until next time, live small and dream big. It, it, it's, it'll be good for a couple... <clears throat> <coughs> <laughs> I almost made that all over myself. That's totally, Is it recording? <laughs> totally making the final cut. <laughs> Someone just... Holy shit, you look like Ted Cruz. I just noticed that. I hate when oh people say that. Oh my God, I just noticed I hate that. when people wow. say that so much. <laughs> all right, I'll give you the whole thing, but... Definitely don't subscribe to his channel. <laughs>